Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by Marketing Trends. This is your host, Jeremy Bergeron. Today I spoke with the CEO of Sabre Astronautics, Jason Held, fascinating entrepreneur. And this guy grew up passionate about space and launched a space company, and now is a big part of all the satellites that are going around the world and, and the, the software that they use, the team that he's built along the way. This is really an interesting conversation. Who doesn't wanna learn about space and satellites? I don't know about you, but I think you're gonna love this episode. Check it out. Hey everybody, welcome back to Marketing Trends. This is your host, Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Strategy at mission.org. And today I'm super excited to have uh, an amazing entrepreneur, uh, Jason Held, the CEO of Sabre Astronautics. Jason, welcome. Hello, Jeremy, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm super excited to connect with you, you know, for, for the audience out there of executives, leaders, and those across the Fortune 1000. I, I met Jason uh, a while back. I guess we're thinking we got to go back at least a couple years, right? Because my daughter's three now. So yeah, so it had to have been at least that. Um, met you in Boulder. Serendipity placed me in the in the Airbnb below you. And, um, and it was just cool to connect with you, man. And, and I loved just what you were up to. And, and I got really interested in you know, the space that you're in, no pun intended. Um, and I just love fast forward that we're here. So I just personally kind of want to hear the catch up of, you know, what's been happening in your world. I'd love to know, you know, kind of what are you most excited to talk about regarding, you know, your path and, and Sabre Astronautics and let's, let's start there. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so starting from, from last week, we met in, I think it was 2018, uh, okay. 20, 2018, 2019, somewhere in there that we met. Um, Sabre Astronautics is a space operations company. We fly satellites for a living. Uh, we do make our own software and things like that, but it's mostly about controlling the birds themselves. Uh, what gets us out of bed in the morning is the idea of the democratization of space, which means that anyone from anywhere in the world can be a part of this industry that we Right, and, and uh, so working a lot with entrepreneurs, as well as larger traditional space missions and things like that. And, and I think when, when we met before, uh, I had started some work with the US Space Force. You know, Sabre's got a, a company in, in Boulder, Colorado, and we've got a separate company in, in Sydney, Australia. And the company's grown uh, a, a fair bit since we talked last. Uh, I think we had about, uh, it, uh, eight people here in, in Boulder and, and 12 people in, in Sydney. Now we've, we've, we've got about 55 people in total. So we've grown a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's quite nice. And, 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 and it's funny because both Sabres com compete to see who could grow a little bit more each time. Ah. Uh, and a friendly competition kind of thing. Uh, and on the Australian side, uh, we won the Mission Control Center a grant with the Australian Space Agency. So our mission control center is like a little Saber Astronautics embassy uh, within the space agency's wow. uh, headquarters. Pretty exciting, like kind of national strategic missions like that. Yeah, was that was that hard to to achieve getting that designation? It was a it was a fist fight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we we competed against uh, companies that were twenty to one hundred times our size. Uh, two of the largest defense uh, contractors in Australia were our, our primary competitors. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, when, you know, the, the lead up to everybody said we couldn't do it. I was getting calls at two in the morning from, from uh, our competitors saying, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing, Jason? You're never going to make it. You know, this kind of stuff, uh, kind of really, really kind of hard nosed, uh, sharp elbow kind of stuff. And we, we persevered and, you know, we, we made it in there. So how, well, how, why did you think you had a chance against, you know, uh, coming in against these, you know, larger, it wasn't an easy, easy move, but how, why did, what made you think you had a chance? Uh, well, if we, if we didn't go for it, I mean, it's the expression you have to be in it to win it is, is the first thing. And if we didn't go for it, guaranteed, we wouldn't have won anything. Uh, our initial thought was, well, they're much larger than us. Let's just be a supplier to them. And, and they were nice enough to, to call us up and, and, and talk to us about it, but the, the, the deals weren't very good deals. Uh, I think what happened was you know, we have a very strong product and, and a very strong brand in that part of the world at least, and, and everybody recognized that. So we were uh, uh, told by the, by the companies we were talking to, kind of like we had to prove that we were good enough in that. And that's how the conversation went. 
how do I know we really want to work with you? I don't know if you're that good. It, you know, oh, yeah, that product looks pretty and all that, but we, we can get our own ourselves. You know, what do we need? So, so the other part, uh, so there wasn't a lot of incentive for partnering in that case. Uh, the other part was we started getting a lot of calls from people asking us if we were bidding, uh, if, yeah, asking us to partner with them to own their bids. Uh, and the volume got high enough where we, we said, you know what, let's go for it. Wow. Okay. So I don't remember if we talked about this in Boulder, but I just curious to know, I know that, you know, your passion for space really for you as when you were a kid, right? Childhoods when that started for you. Um, and I want to know kind of what, what t- talk us through kind of the beginning of when you saw that there was this opportunity with Sabre, right? Like you, where you saw this, okay, wait a second, passion for space. There's this opportunity to democratize a, a, something that's massive and disrupt and you can disrupt it. Like what was the genesis of that for you that, that, that became real? Uh, well, the desire to start a space company, I was going to do that. In my mind. I mean, that, that's okay. something that is kind of like a, uh, uh, since I was in uh, yeah, Space Command, so my personal history is, is when I lived in Boulder before I, I was with uh, with Army Space Command, and, and me and some of my buddies were sitting around talking, they're like, hey, you know what, you know, we should do a space company. Business to government, if you know how to play that game, is really, really lucrative if you do it right. Um, fast forward, I did my PhD in Australia, and what had happened in the interim was this was about 2007 when I was graduating. Uh, and there was a new category of satellites called CubeSats, which was, uh, the, if, if you think about the size of a spacecraft back, back then for an industry level mission and things that are doing satellite communications or, or earth observation, things that, that produce large amounts of money, these historically are half a billion dollar spacecraft, massive infrastructure required to do something like that. Well, the new category was had just been invented uh, between 2005, 2007, and they were the size of a toaster. The cost for for starting your space company was less than half the cost of a juice bar franchise. Wow! Wow! Talk about disruptive opportunity. Um. So there you go. So you, so so, where how how are you positioned to see that? Ha- like happening, like you, you saw this, this move, the shift from the old, you know, these massive, very costly things to now, like, was that a pretty quick transition or did you just hear about it? You saw something like oh, that's super interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, there was, um, there was a couple of, it, it basically spun out of university research. Uh, and, and we, we saw the first CubeSats come out in the early 2000s and it couldn't do much. It was you know, the size of literally a cube. That's why they call it CubeSats are literally like this and uh, you're like, it can't, it can't do a whole lot, but, but then people started experimenting with it, and they're cheap enough that you could fail and still live. You, they're cheap enough that, that you, you can put small amounts of investment, bootstrappable. We saw startups for uh, 150, our first customer was $150,000 uh, uh, off a Kickstarter out of California. Wow. You know, cheap as chips. Wait, wow. So. That's so interesting. So was it the, the, what was the, what was the first offer? Like when you, when you created Sabre, like what's the first thing you offered? Was it, you're sending things into space, capturing imagery, selling that data? Like what was the initial offer? So, all right. So, so we first, so Sabre failed originally. That's, that's the hidden story. I don't talk okay. about very often. Um, ah. I don't talk about this very often. Nobody asked me about this, to be honest. Uh, I was okay. happy with it discuss it but no we we found it in 2007 in colorado while i was finishing my graduate school in in australia and my wife and i were going to move back up here uh, and our partners and our friends that that joined us were all in the local area and they got we were going to make the first space rated uh microchip for sun microsystems first space rated avionics for sun microsystems wow. sun was into the space game. uh global financial crisis happened Six weeks later, Sun wow. gets bought by Oracle. Contract goes away. We no. Wow! Uh, the tech we were going to apply and our differentiator at the time, uh, Saber uh, has been doing machine learning uh, to diagnose the health of a satellite. You know, kind of like you're seeing machine learning for human health. 
we were doing that for satellites the uh, moment we started. So there are all these applications we were going to do. Um, but since it, since, since it died, we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? We'll, we'll keep the company alive as, a, as yeah, yeah, open as, as long as we can, no expenses, just keep it going. And we're going to restart Sabre in Australia, which has totally different challenges. Australia tends to get hit by financial crisis five, three to five years after the United States, just the financial mm. cycles. So we said, we got a couple of years, we can, we can try something here. Wow. Uh, but they don't have any, at the time, they didn't have any uh, local revenue like the U.S. has. It's all an import economy. So we made these mass market products that were fun. Uh, you know, like a beer you could drink in space and things like that. And had a bit of fun until we, we gathered enough momentum to get back into the game. Oh, wow. So had, had, to, had to pivot majorly and then started just creating, iterating until what was the, what was the, what was the thing where you hit, where you hit the home run? Like, okay, now we're back in the game. What, what happened? Um, that, that was, I, uh, that, that, the first one, was in Australia. Uh, that was a mission operation research program that Australia wanted to do with India. Uh, and that was not a lot of money. That was $50,000, right? This was yeah, our, our cash back into the, in, into the game, very small amount of money. Um, and uh, we just used that as a seed to build more and more larger contracts. Uh, and uh, we kept doing that in, until uh, I, I think we we were doing mission design as a service, as an entry level service, uh, for companies that we would want to fly later on. Wow! And uh, the 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 uh, I mean the, the first one that was that company in California with that little one that I, I mentioned. Uh, but the next ones after that were the Australian local market was starting to grow and start picking those up and, and helping get that ball rolling. Wow! So. That's so interesting. So, uh, you know, as a proponent of space democratization, you, you yourself, a prolific space educator, how do you think about kind of striking a balance between these, you know, the scientific jargon of, of this space and making it easily understandable? Well, your, your customers love the jargon. That, that's the thing. Like, like uh, there's two different customer segments. There's like the, the space industry specific, the traditionalists, they want the jargon. Uh, and and uh, then there's the general public, the new entrance to the space industry, what they call new space, uh, a little bit less so, especially if you're trying to communicate what you're doing to the public. You really have to use the Napoleon's private approach and just make it really straightforward, really simple to use. What do you do for a living? We fly satellites for a living. Done. So you're able to, you're able to, you know, you know, the narrative is different for each of the customers and you can meet them. Those that want that, the jargon, like you said, great. You have that. You can also keep it really simple as Absolutely. well as you, as you scale. That's really cool. Absolutely. Um, so because of the kind of user-friendly tools you've created at Sabre, you know, talk about that because it seems like the industry, the space industry has changed and you've, you've done these things that allows users to kind of bypass learning complex training tools. And I'd love to hear more about that. So historically space tools, uh, are very bespoke. It's kind of like the matrix. You've got uh, a whole bunch of words on a screen and operators are trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, and we said, why don't you turn that into a video game? Right, so it's easy to use. There's human interfaces, user interfaces, modern UI UX design, um, and actually uh, reduce the barrier to entry to actually fly. Make space as easy as flying a car is is our goal. Wow. So yeah. So normally, like you, you need a PhD or a master's and 15 years experience to get trusted with with the satellite. And we've got undergraduate interns, uh, 21 years old, 20 years old. Uh, first time to sit down. Have a go. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so, so you're marketing, are you essentially marketing to like, who's the primary customer? I know there's obviously governments, military, yep. um, or who, who are the other like site types of customers that you're marketing to? Right. I mean, you, you've got the business to government, uh, the, 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 which is the obvious one. Uh, the business to business one is the other one. We market to people who own satellites. We okay. market to people who, and we especially like, 
younger companies that are in the, uh, they, they might have won their first Series A round the series B round. So okay, okay. between five and, and 10 million, uh, five to 20 million kind of, kind of rank. Cause they're really, they really need what we have to offer. They're, they're, they're the target market. Um, but what we found is by getting ready for them, we're also in a zone for uh, a lot of the primes, the, the larger companies is a tiered supplier. So that's a totally different kind of market segment mm. dealing with them. Are you are you seeing? I mean, working with the Australian government, working with the U.S. government, is kind of getting you having your feet in both of those experiences. Are there are there a ton of similar you know dissimilar things that you go with each one, or you feel like you can really tell that these are both government entities? They both do the same things. They both care about the same things, or is it completely different challenges? It there's some. It's mostly the same. Okay. Right? It's, it's very nationalistic. You're doing national strategic missions. There's security around that. Uh, there's a way to talk to them. And the way to talk to an American defense person has a lot of similarities to talking to an Australian defense person. Very often they're friends on other sides of the pond, uh, which is nice. Um, it, they're, they're all very nationalistic. So we get a lot of questions. Are you an Australian company or are you an American company? So we have to explain that. So no, we're really both, you know, we're an Australian and an American, yeah, you know, things like that. But it, it's 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 very similar kind of language. So you mentioned earlier about kind of the two Australian company and the U.S. company will kind of compete, but you're still leading yeah. both of those, right? You're still CEO of both. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so, okay, you have this decade plus, you know, experience in machine learning. I'm really curious about this from your perspective. Where, where could AI and machine learning, you know, really be used more effectively in the space industry? Oh, wow. Uh, great question. Um, well, diagnosing the health of the satellite. Uh, so the operator knows what's going wrong. Um, can, unlike your car, you can't just look at an indicator and, and say, here's why that's happening. You actually have to diagnose remotely. Um, uh, tracking large numbers of space objects. The space traffic is a big problem now. Uh, you've got so many new spacecraft entering the field. Uh, the market's growing and uh, tripling over the next you know, eight years. So uh, how do you manage that asset using machine learning for that? Uh, tracking radiation in space, we call it space weather. It's kind of like you're tracking the weather here on Earth, but it's weather from the sun. Wow. Um, all sorts of different things that you could do. Uh, from the military side of things as well, uh, and space traffic, trying to identify what a space, here's my spacecraft, what my spacecraft is doing. Is it coming to you on purpose or is it an accident? Uh, all these different things, because you're not there, you can't see it. So you right. need to help you. The space traffic piece is interesting too. I saw um, a friend, a colleague of mine sent this through um, a couple of weeks ago, but he showed kind of, it was a short clip of, all of the various like satellites, I guess that are just above, and it was all colors. It was, it looked like, I mean, pl planes, every, I mean, it was, there was so many of them. I was like, there's that many out there and they were all representing different things and um, had different owners and businesses. And I just had no concept that there could be that many out there. So the space traffic components interesting too, because you've got to consider everyone else that's getting up there and in some ways kind of fighting for that real estate, if that's a thing. That's definitely a thing. It's definitely a thing. And people are doing things by accident. It's kind of like barnstorming from, from like aviation in the 1910s. You know, people wow. are uh, running crazy. And, and there is no space traffic solution globally. There's nothing. Really? Right? The, the U.S. military has been running it uh, for most of the Western world. Um, but they want to be space warriors, not space traffic cops. Mm. Right? And you got so much more material coming out there. We've got... 7,500 satellites that are active in space today. And uh, I think that's going to grow to 40,000 by the end of the, the decade. Some people are predicting 100,000 satellites. And for every satellite, you got 10 times more in pieces of debris and other bric-a-brac floating around. And it's all traveling at eight kilometers a second. And if you get hit by one of those, you know, that, that'll ruin your day. So yeah. Um, space traffic is definitely a thing that everybody's thinking about and, and, and we do a lot of work in that, in that, in that field. So are you developing solutions for that as well? Specifically yeah, for that? Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Uh, and we have to track it for our customers, you know, because mm. a lot of them don't get that information, you know, and, uh, 
you know, we do exercises with, yeah, the, the, the military three times a year where, where everybody gets together and compares notes. And, and it's really one of those areas where everybody does have to collaborate. Uh, wow. To some degree. That's interesting. So what, so what, you know, what, what would you say is, you know, the, the up kind of upcoming and in, in current biggest challenges you're experiencing now, like as a business and from a growth perspective or, or otherwise, like, what do you, to me, as I reflect on where you've, what you've done so far, it's like so many interesting mountains you've climbed, so many interesting things you've had to navigate around, up, through, under, you know, what's kind of the big growth opportunity now for you of like, what's the next thing you have to kind of figure out here? Um, well, it's a technical thing. I'm from a sales side of things and a business model, I, I think we got it. Uh, I mean, we, we better after all this time, <laughs> you know, we better have it. Uh, but we've got a lot of customers uh, and a lot of requests. We have full manifests. But we, in order for us to scale more, we have to add more automation into the onboarding of a new customer. So we get a new customer. There's a very large bespoke technical process that, that we're automating and in some degrees open sourcing, things like this. Uh, it, to make it easier to, to bring them, because that's, that's our bottle. We have a very, very well-defined, well-known bottleneck that we know what to do to, to fix. Mm. So that's, that's really the effort at the moment. Wow. And you're, I mean, in terms of this idea of kind of monitoring and regulating space, I mean, do, you, do we need a global body to kind of monitor and regulate space? Like, what could that look like? Is that a good thing? Is that not a good thing? We need someone to do it. Uh, it. It can't be a military. It can't be a single government. It has to be a consortium of governments. I think it should be public-private partnership, mm. right? Uh, because right now, a lot of companies like Saber are competing for tools to be a part of that next gold rush. Uh, and it's, it's a hard thing to justify because it's related to safety of flight. Like you don't, the airlines, yeah, you, you don't pay uh, when you when you get a, a an airline ticket for uh, all the safety around the the airplane. You're paying for the ticket, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think a similar thing is going to have to happen in the space industry, especially as human beings are going to be flying. Well, already flying now in space. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So you so. So it's interesting. It's like you said, there's this, there's this really, there's this real concept of like collaboration with people that you're, you know, either com maybe competing with or working and at some mm -hmm. level with, and there's also competition too, you know? So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. You got to kind of, it sounds like there's this collaboration. There's also competition. Yeah. All, all the time, all the time. It's it, it, a lot of frenemies. Um, and I, I think with these space traffic exercises, we could build more friendships out of it, but some companies will be really good at a, at a specific tool that you need. Uh, like like uh, some code to see if you're colliding with each other. Uh, some companies are really good at providing data. Uh, we're really good at the live day-to-day -day operations and visualizing what the world looks like. Um, and it really does take everybody in, in one tent to solve some of these problems. Mm, that's so cool. Um, over you know your career in space, what advancements have you seen come sooner than you anticipated? Like what capabilities or technologies are developing that you know are more maybe more gradually than you thought? Oh, great question. Um, the space plane uh, uh, and, and, and launch technologies, the space plane kind of ideas took longer than we all thought because we saw demonstrations over ten years ago and we thought, oh, this is it. We're all going up now and, and it took 10 years to go. Kind of, now we're finally starting. Uh, but the, the biggest and probably most pleasant surprise was SpaceX uh, uh, reusable rockets. The, the entry for reusable rockets was much quicker than I think anybody anticipated. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, contributing to the lower, the reduced cost. Do you have, do you, have you ever connected with Elon? No, um, he. I was literally right before this interview. I was listening to uh, a, a, a chunk of his interview with Joe Rogan, and Joe Rogan asked him like, "Why did you do space planes? Like, why why didn't you do it? You know?" Yeah. And um, he talked about how he thought about it, but that it would hurt his brain if he went down that <laughs> down that path. So he chose, you know, SpaceX and other things. But um, you know, he's living in Austin now. Oh, uh, no, I, I didn't know. His brother has a has a restaurant here. Really. Much. Yeah, yeah. So he's, I've I've actually heard that he's he's like a big time restaurateur, like an amazing entrepreneur as well. His brother. 
Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's got some good it, it, I rate it well. I rate the food quite well, actually. Nice. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Um, this is so cool. So um, you, you talked about, you know, the, 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 the biggest challenge you're going through in terms of like, what, what's the biggest thing on deck for you to focus on? You, it seems like you really understand who your customer is. You really understand that you can, you know, you know who you're serving and supporting. Is it now just a race to capture as much market share as possible? Or is there still so much time and attention needed to be focused on R&D? you know, as well, like how, what's the balance of like, you've kind of refined your offering, you know what you're doing now, you know how to do it, you're doing it well. And there's also this really fast moving space where there's all this iteration and all this R and D happening. Where do you see Sabre in that? Uh, Sabre is always going to be heavy in the R and D. Uh, maybe right these days, it's about uh, 40, 60. So 40% R and D, 60% sales, biz dev, tech development, things like that. Uh, and I, and I'll always kind of take that stance because uh, it's a it's a deep tech field. It's very competitive, and and our strategy of keeping ahead of the game is having a product that's better than everybody else. And we've had to do that because we we you know we're, we're smaller than than most of the people out there doing these. This is why we're killing the contracts that we're killing is mm. because people look at our product and it's kind of like. I and mean, from a sales perspective, as, as a marketing guy, you'll, you'll relate to this. It's, it's like uh, Breaking Bad, you know, where, where, mm -hmm. uh, where they try the meth, but they, they don't just buy a bag of meth. They try, oh, my God, that's the best, best meth I've ever had. It's, it, selling uh, space is a lot like that. You have to have the best product out there just to get in the door mm. you know, in this position. So R and D, it's always going to be like you said. It's, it's, it's can't not do it. Got to got to have a focus there as well. And there's an opportunity to serve the market where they're at too, you know? So it's kind of this interesting balance of having to do both things really well. Yeah. Um, when you're, when you're marketing, because it's such a niche, obviously thing that you're doing, I mean, is there an actual marketing mix? Like, are you, are you doing anything traditionally? Are you doing anything to reach people digitally in terms of getting the attention of your, you know, kind of few buyer personas? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot different there marketing what we do versus marketing a lemonade stand. I mentioned math. I, I probably shouldn't stick to that in this conversation. But <laughs> it, it's not. It's not too different. You've, you've got your social media. You've, you've got your traditional uh, news and print, and, and um, you've got you know, targeted events and, and trade shows. Trade shows are big because it's where you, it's B two B and B two G. So you do a lot of your deals and, and trade shows, and uh, your customers will go to that because they know you're, you're there as well. Uh, but having having your your brand in front of people's faces at a continuous click uh, is really important. Uh, I would say we've been more successful at that in Australia than we have in the United States for various mm -hmm. reasons. Um, uh, the, the, the media channels are, are a little narrower in, in Australia than they are in the United States. Interesting. To kind of uh, get a good story out there, everyone's going to see it. Um, and there are a couple of publications that you know if you go to. Uh, but it, it, it's it's no it's no difference. I think it, the difference with us is is that uh, uh, as a space company, we haven't played a whole lot except for certain products in in the consumer market, All right? So you're, 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 we're not trying to do what SpaceX is doing is getting on TV and, right. and having right. everybody. We, we, we don't. It, it doesn't make a difference in our in our revenues. But getting in front of um, uh, the defense establishments so they're seeing us every day talking to us every day uh, and, and you know, people in government, that's, that's pretty critical. Mm. Same, well, same well, tricks, different market. That's not, you know. Yeah, I know. I love that. So, so, so you are leveraging like paid search and you're doing some of the digital things. Also you're doing traditional things. It says like events and uh, TV, radio, things like that. Um, that's really interesting. Mm. So in ter in terms of a sales cycle though, are these, cause it's, to me, it's like, long sales cycles, right? And this, these things are probably, yeah. Huge, so huge. Yeah. you talk about the journey, the journey that a buyer goes through, right? To finally become a Sabre Astronautics client. And that journey can be, can take some time, right? Uh, it can take up to a year. Uh, for, okay. for a real flight, it takes a year. Okay. Um, and, but we, like, we have a, a, a segment of our product, which, which is for uh, universities and students. It's, it's democratized. Um, and we use that uh, and freemium software to get people in the door using our 
our website, using our, our tools, getting used to us as a company, you know, building the trust. Um, but the, that, that whole customer acquisition process, it's a massive exercise in trust. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, when, once you have them on the team uh, and, and you prove yourself as able to help them, uh, then then the loyalty is also very high. Mm. Is this the PGI, PIGI software? Is that the, one of the yeah, things you make, you make available? It, you call it Piggy? Okay. Yeah, we got tired of Greek. Like in the space, everybody's like, like the, the Thor, you know, Thunder stuff. Not animal, right? it was called <laughs> Farm Animals Piggy. I love um, it. Yeah. Okay. So Piggy, you know, what what are the kind of the capabilities of Piggy? And is that's been a pretty big part of your tool belt, right? Having that available. Yeah, uh, that's been with us for, for, for a while. Uh, so, so Piggy is our mission control software. Also, we use it for entry-level design. Uh, and um, it, you're able to, to design all of your orbits and plan any orbit from, from pretty much any planet in the solar system and, uh, and use the outputs of that to plan your business. Okay, so for students, they use it for their, their student projects and things like that. But we really made this useful for entrepreneurs, uh, people who want to start their own space businesses someday. Uh, they use it to calculate the addressable market for their mission plan. Wow. And we've been having business plan competitions. We've been spinning out an incubator. Uh, that incubator itself has generated a couple million in, in uh, contracts for its members. That's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we're we're kind of talking about that customer acquisition process, getting them early, helping them raise investment, which we couldn't do. We couldn't raise investment ourselves just because of the timing. But for them, it's a different environment. So we help them out. We They, they raise their money and then uh, hopefully they stick with us uh, as their ops uh, supplier. Are there, are there in, uh, industries that maybe weren't interested in space or interested in connecting with you that are kind of coming out of like newer industries or newer segments within industries that maybe surprise you or are now kind of at the table that maybe they weren't before? I would call them, uh, there, there's a lot of downstream services industries, uh, clean tech, uh, FinTech is a, is a it, it is not fully realized for space, but it, I, I think it's got a toe in the water right now. FinTech's an interesting one. Uh, we had a couple of calls from people wanting to put uh, a, a crypto satellite on orbit, uh, and th they're asking interesting questions like, are the laws any different when you're in space? Who's your jurisdiction uh, if you're rotating every 90 minutes? Or, right, or, right. Or, how does that actually work? Um, I, I haven't seen a lot of them convert into actual missions yet. It's a lot of okay. kind of looky loop, but it could, it could still happen you know, with some of these. Uh, there's a lot of customers in Internet of Things. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of interest in space-based Internet of Things. Uh, it's kind of a subset of the communications industry. Um, and then you've got your uh, satellite imagery companies that are taking pictures and, uh, of the Earth and trying to count the number of cars at Walmart and turning that into, into downstream value. Wow. So that, that's, that's so interesting. I was going to ask about blockchain and kind of how you see that playing into the space that you're in. Um, yeah. Are you bullish? Are you bullish on blockchain? I, I don't care. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's a tool, right? I mean, it's, 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 a, I'm not bullish on a tool. I'm, I'm bullish right. on the value that it gives a customer. Mm. Uh, like, like for us, blockchain would be a supplier, not a customer. Um, uh, in things like quantum computing and all this extra tech that we're seeing starting, these days, these are suppliers more than customers usually. Uh, but I, I guess we, we, we signed a deal uh, with a company called Axiom Space uh, that we announced two weeks ago. Uh, and they're interesting because they are a commercial space station. Uh, they have the NASA contract. Uh, and I'm probably going to mess this up. So if you're an Axiom person listening, please <laughs> Uh, but but they're going to be taking over the space station one module at a time. So mm. as the space station uh, nears its end of life, these guys will take over. Uh, so working with them, we're going to be setting up an astronaut program. Uh, we're going to be connecting directly with industry that wants to build new products in space wow. Wow. that have competitive advantage to what they're seeing here. Man, that's that's exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, 
I, I mean, what are you most excited about right now? Because there's so that, much amazing that, stuff. Yeah, that's epic. No, I mean, honestly, 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 the, the, the human experience in, in low Earth orbit is trillions of dollars in, 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 in orbit right now. Trillions of dollars worth of stuff that we use for the data superhighway of the 21st century. And that's exciting because it's good business. But what I'm really passionate about, I want to I see all that, that money and economy go further, go to the moon, go further out. And this deal with, with Axiom, I see as, as part of the very first step of what we see is gonna be happening in the next 10 years, all right? It's a complete change in how we use space in the next 10 years. It's what we all dreamed of, you know? So wow. it's happening. That's amazing, man. Well, would you go up there? Let me know. So I wanna take a trip up there with you. I'm sure you probably have a long line of folks that wanna go with you. I'm gonna go to the pub. Uh, <laughs> and, and, yes and, yes. And, if I manage to go up, that's great. But if I if I don't, I'm happy to send younger generations up there. But yeah, oh, that's back. awesome. I love it, man. That's so cool. Um, this has been awesome. I um, We've got some kind of lightning round questions that are just kind of fun that we'll ask here at the end. But uh, anything anything else that you want to make sure we cover? I Look, I, I think that was an yeah, excellent uh, So Let's do the lightning round. Okay, let's do it. All right, cool. So uh, Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com forward slash marketing. We've got Jason Held, CEO of Saber Astronautics. First question, the lightning round. Ooh, what's your favorite restaurant in Boulder? Oh, hell. Yes, yes, the most difficult, uh, Steakhouse 316. Okay, Steakhouse 316, okay. Uh, what is your favorite planet? Earth. <laughs> nice. Just wanted to make sure you never know. Uh, <laughs> um, what, what's been your favorite? This is this is my I'm curious to know this one. What's been your favorite research project? Oh, boy, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the most fun I ever had in science was drinking beer on the vomit comet, drinking beer, mm. rotating 360 on my face. That was the most fun. Uh, beer is not going to change the world. In the in the sense that we want to, but but the the, the projects that that we're doing now that we're starting up now, I think are are the most exciting. Can can you can you tell us about any new exciting recent research in the space industry? Um, that's a very broad question. Uh, it's hard to pick just one. Um, I, I I see a movement towards uh, lunar missions. We've got four companies that have reached out to us saying they want to fly to the moon. Mm -hmm. That that keeps me up at night with excitement. That that one, that one, and the Axiom deal. Those two, it's just yeah. That, the, mm. Those those uh, keep me uh, keep me awake and very excited. Do you want to go to Mars? Yes. Is Mars travel going to happen in our lifetime? Yes. Uh, how good is Australian space beer? If you like a stout, it's excellent. It's, it's an exceptional beer. Um, it's a, a Russian Imperial, so it's got a very strong, uh, earthy, caramelly kind of flavor uh, with the, with a bit of a, uh, a hoppy aftertaste. It's a little hoppier than your normal beers. That has to do with with the the Four Pines Brewery that that we work with to to brew it and anything else. Love it's a that. very, it's a very good beer. If you like that style. I love it. That's cool. Okay. Last question. Um, best advice that kind of, you would go back and tell your early, your, your first kind of stepping into CEO role. What advice would you give yourself now? Um, learn to sell earlier. I, uh, this is probably the best advice. Any one who transitions from academia to business should get. I wouldn't have been receptive to it. I didn't see sales as as a uh, it, yeah as it, as a difficult field until I actually had to do it. Mm. So a bit of a heads up would have been really good. I love that. That's real. That's powerful. That definitely that's going to be meaningful for a lot of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs coming early entrepreneurs that I know listen and are kind of entering into that space. So awesome, uh, Jason. Thank you so much for being here. So cool to catch up with you. I'm very bullish and excited on Saber Astronautics and such an honor, man. Thank you. Yeah, honor's mine, Jeremy. Absolute legend. Thank you so much for this interview. It was a lot of fun.